Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Currency of Anarchy. I'm Josh Davis. I'm Thomas Shane. And uh, if you'd like to be a part of the conversation on our Monday tapings, uh, we are taping at 9 o'clock at youtube.com slash user slash cur of anarchy slash live. And uh, then we take it, we edit it, we put up some graphics, and we post it up to the Voluntary Virtues Network, and that's at youtube.com slash user slash voluntary virtues. So please check out both. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. We want to hear some comments. We want to hear your questions. So, uh, yeah, please join the conversation. First thing that we want to talk about today is parks and forests. Uh, you know, how they would still exist in anarchism, how uh, private entities would take care of these things and why they would and you know, what's their motivation, um, you know, why we don't actually need a government to do any of this. So um, I, I think that the first thing that's, uh, I was discussing this, and uh, the first thing that really came to uh, the other person's mind was how or why anybody has a motivation to save a tree or um, you know we, we have this propensity to demolish forests uh, at least currently um, you know you bring up South America that kind of thing uh, the jungles and all this other stuff you demolish trees and you're building houses and other buildings whatever um, now I guess this would still obviously happen in anarchism and I think that it's just yes it is kind of human nature but at the same time people do want to save forests and you know that kind of thing um, I don't think you actually need the force of government in order to save forests um, because if uh, a business was just solely focused on saving forests, then what they'd have to do is claim the forest and maintain it themselves. And people would come to see the forest. You know, you pay the property owner uh, in order to see the forest or... Um, to just have it in order to you know keep that oxygen level up that we need um, so it's not so much that the earth needs it it's we need it and animals need it so in that sense that's why a forest would be maintained and uh, same thing kinda goes for parks I mean it doesn't need to be done by the public uh, sector it, it is done by the private sector at the same time so there are public and private parks right now. Um, yeah, that's the first thing that comes to my mind. Uh, what do you think, Thomas? Um, well, I agree. With, I agree with basically everything you said. I um, there, there's a lot of examples. People think that, so. When you talk about public versus private ownership, uh, there are already examples everywhere of public versus private ownership. And the facts are there, they're plain and simple. If you look at publicly owned goods, resources, and lands, most of the time you're going to see, you know, more often than not, you're going to see that they're not as well, they're not as well taken care of uh, as privately owned spaces and areas are because what it comes down to is incentive. And um, the, a really good example of that is the tragedy of the commons. When, when resources are publicly, publicly owned, um, basically what happens is everyone everyone has an incentive to to use those everybody has an incentive to use the resources in the public spaces and whatnot um, but when it comes you know no, how they're how publicly owned uh, areas like par public parks publicly owned resources are taken care of through when they're taken care of through taxes everybody pays a small amount it goes there, it goes to pay for those things, and then you use those things, you have an incentive to use those things. 
um, I just don't think the incentive to take care of them is as is as is as wide. I just don't think the incentive is there to take care of the things when you know that it's not just it's not your responsibility really. You're set. You're you're separated from the responsibility. So you're you're separated, Raina. So you're separated from the responsibility of when you're separated from taking responsibility for something. There's less incentive there to actually do so because you're not going to be held accountable if you're not. If you know, if a park is a public park, obviously everyone in the community isn't physically there taking care of it, cutting the grass, making sure the play equipment is safe and in working order, because you just rely on other people to do that. Other people who don't really have an incentive to do that, other than the fact that, as government, I'm talking about publicly owned spaces, as government. The only reason they're providing these things in the first place is because they're expected to do so. But it's not really in their best interest to, to upkeep these things, to take care of public parks, public bathrooms like that, because if they're not, they're basically the accountability isn't there. They're separated from the accountability for what they're doing. Whereas if, you're, if there's private ownership, it's, you have a direct responsibility because if you're not taking care of your own privately owned property, the only one who suffers is you. You will ultimately suffer the cost of whatever is not done and whatever damage occurs. So, the reason why uh, forests are cut down is because no one owns it. There's no uh, accountability. Uh, that's exactly how oceans work. At the same time, um, you know, people go out and fish. Nobody owns it. There's no problem in that. Uh, they can do what they want, but. Um, then, you know, when you have uh, things like the ExxonMobil thing, uh, you know, the oil spills, and uh, BP had an oil spill, you know, uh, there were free market solutions offered to them, but at the same time, the government was um, uh, saying that they were liable up to a point, and uh, why? You know, it... Uh, what gives the United States the right to uh, take that um, responsibility away? Well, nobody owns the ocean, for one thing. Second off, uh, it is a corporation, so it's a figment of the government, and they want to keep them in business in, in that sense. Uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of straying off point, but um, I guess that's... What I'm trying to get at is exactly what you're saying, the problem of the commons, you know, the tragedy. So, uh, you know, that's why um, literally this idea of the tragedy of the commons came into being uh, with commons. Uh, you know, there was such a thing as the Boston Common, the Salem Common, and all these other things. I'm, I'm talking local, I guess, but... Um, people were allowed to graze their cattle on this land uh, and nobody had the responsibility to clean it up so it always stank and um, you know it, it's just crap it's literally crap it, it, like you were talking about um, public versus ba private bathrooms yeah they have a this incentive to do right by the customer to clean up that bathroom while you know, if you go to a park or a train station, you're not going to see the well kept-ness of a restaurant or something like that. Uh, it's just so blatantly obvious when you look at it, that stark perspective, you know, it's, it's black and white to me. Um, I, I always think about this one thing, and it, it just, it's so obvious. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that's a, but, I agree with that's exactly it. That, that's what I was trying to get at with my whole incentive thing. Is that when with private right. private ownership, if you're if you're in a business, if you're operating a business, you want your customers to have an enjoyable experience because they're investing in it, and you want them to have an enjoyable experience. Otherwise, they're not as likely to want to patronize your business. They will go patronize someone else's business who provides them a more enjoyable service, who takes better care of their, you know, you don't want to go into a store that's filthy and disgusting and has the, you know, the bathroom is a mess and all that. You're going to want to go to a store and give them your money where it's going to be clean and organized and, and pleasant for you to be there 
and you'll be able to find things and you have you'll be able to purchase them for reasonable amounts of money and whereas with public ownership specifically government owned property and resources and services there's no there's no duty there's no responsibility to them for their for them to provide you an enjoyable service because you're not a customer to them you're a citizen you're someone who is underneath them essentially there's no incentive for a for a politician to want to keep um, other than keeping his job, there's no other incentive for them to want to take care of publicly owned spaces because they're just, how are they going to benefit from that? There's no direct benefit from that. Whereas in private ownership, there is a direct benefit and there is a direct cost if you're not maintaining your, your resources, your goods, your services, and maintaining the integrity of them. Um, and yeah, yeah there, and there are plenty of, there's, there are so many examples of this in this country and all over the world of public versus private ownership providing the same services, um, most notably the Postal Service versus FedEx and USPS, where f privately owned, like FedEx and USPS, or F FedEx and UPS, sorry, uh, are going to be more, you know, they're, you're a customer to them. They're expected to provide you a, a service uh, responsibly, not losing your mail, getting it, not losing your packages, getting them to you. Uh, in a reasonable time and condition, um, whereas the postal service, you know, they have mono What do they? You said they have a monopoly on letter carrying, right? So basically, yeah. there's no there's no way that they can disappear. There's no way they can be put out of business. So there's no there's no incentive for them to want to provide you a service because when you don't, for, there's no incentive for them to want to provide you a, a good service. Because right. if you don't like the service, it doesn't matter because you have no other alternatives. And it was just like you were saying with the Boston Commons and that sort of thing too. That that's exactly it. Everybody wants to enjoy the publicly owned resources because it's not because you know it's not their responsibility to take care of them. They're not going to. Right. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking like if if you go into a restaurant, yeah, they'll have a very well kept. Uh, bathroom and uh, yeah it, it, it there is that um, competition level when you when you go into a public bathroom you are still paying for it in a sense you're still a customer but um, yeah there's uh, there is no competition yeah right uh, but somebody's gonna pay for it so how nice of them to provide you a, a bathroom to go along with it even though it stinks <laughs> and is disgusting so, yeah, it's really disgusting. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Usually, I, I'm, I guess I'm making it a very generic statement. Um, I guess I'm being sort of um, uh, stereotypical, but at the same time, it, it is statistic, you know, uh, in a way. Uh, if you take up the quality of all the public bathrooms versus all the private ba bathrooms, you'll see a pretty stark contrast. But uh, yeah, sometimes uh, if you go into uh, like a fast food place, those bathrooms can be pretty bad, actually. Uh, anyway, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but that's, um, I don't know. I, would re I really wouldn't know what to say about that. Um, oh, yeah. But uh, there, to be fair, though, there are examples of private enterprise, private industries and enterprises that are Basically, they're not always held. A lot of times, they are comparable to a publicly owned resource or or service or whatever. Um, I I don't think it's so much about that as it is about just having a choice, having comp having a market with competition. Because you can be a privately owned company, and if you have a monopoly on something, you can behave the way that a government agency would because. They have no alternative. There's no choice. They either use your service or they don't have that service. Um, right. And like a good, almost... a good example of that is the tr the, tri the public transportation around here, the buses. Uh, a lot of the times they're just really dirty and gross and they're late and the bus stops are filled with trash and it doesn't matter because there's no alternative transit system for you to choose from. So you don't have a choice. It doesn't matter. So I guess it ultimately, in my opinion, it comes down to people having a choice um, 
you should always have a market with different choices for every service because that's how you maintain the integrity of those services. Right. I, I highly agree. Um, the, the problem is uh, I just wanted to clarify that uh, in that there is uh, there are examples of poorly kept bathrooms or whatever, mm -hmm. but that's not the point, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, uh, I guess that's a pretty generic topic, but uh, let's move on. Um, I I wanted to talk about um, the difference between law and legislation. I, I, I guess we were having, or I was having a discussion with uh, one of our friends and uh, kind of a big group, apparently. Um, what is the difference between law and legislation? Some people were like, well, without uh, in anarchism, you won't have any law. That's simply not true. Because at least you'll have equity. You know, um, that's the only way arbiters will be able to uh, figure out contracts and that kind of thing. Um, uh, pretty simple stuff, though. It, it's just like, what's the right thing in this situation? You know, how does this contract line up with what these two people were thinking at the time and all this other stuff? Um, and. In my opinion, there would be common law. You know, th that would be like a like a rollover from 1215 and onwards, and that kind of thing. Um, but legislation is an entirely different beast in that it's created by some people on a high pedestal, thinking that they know the best thing for 300 million people, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's statute. It's positive law. It's not really natural law. And natural law always existed, at least in my opinion. Um, it's just that now we're recognizing it. We're understanding what true liberty actually is. Uh, and this probably has been um, coming about for the last oh, 600, 700 years, something like that. But um, to me, there is a difference between law and legislation. But, um, yeah, when you talk about legislation, it ca it's considered a part of law, but it's not the whole law. And when you get rid of uh, a, the legislative branch in the United States, uh, you would have just natural law. You wouldn't have positive law. You wouldn't have statutes. That's, that's what we're trying to get at here, in my opinion. Um, I don't know. Uh, do you have anything to add, Thomas? Um, not to add, just to kind of clarify on that a lot of people get confused with law and legality, and they're not, they're not really the same thing, at least not natural law and legality. Um, legality is man is just there. It's basically legislation, which is what basically man-made arbitrary rules. Uh, and ordinances and statutes and all these things that basically, like you said, they're positive laws. They infringe upon others and they basically try to dictate others' behavior. Whereas natural law tends to stem more from uh, just basic moral principles. And a lot of people get confused on that. And a lot of people also kind of, um, they just feel like, one thing I tell people all the time that le legality and law are not they're not exactly the same thing and legality is does not dictate morality because something is legal does not make it moral and vice versa a lot of really immoral things are legal and a lot of laws in un, in and of themselves are immoral like drug laws and prostitution laws and any laws that infringe upon the the bodies or property of harmless people um, but yeah I mean a lot of that's yeah, I mean, I it's sometimes it's hard to to talk about things because we both just agree on on so much, and so we just kind of say the same things in different ways. But <laughs> yeah, it's basically it. it's na anarchy kind of stems more is is kind of based more on natural law and not you don't need legality to have law. It's not you don't need government to have law and morality. You just have basic, just common, uh, universally preferable behaviors. 
uh, and just that sort of thing where you don't, you know, you don't treat other people how you don't want to be treated. You don't, you, the non-aggression principle, you don't aggress on other people, you don't initiate force or harm on them or their property. So you don't need legality for that. You don't need courts for that. You don't need a government courts for that, I should say. You could have uh, like uh, DROs and stuff for if someone damaged your property or, or that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, you definitely don't need a government for that. There are so many other alternatives. And I think a big problem is that people think they see in such black and white terms that it's either full-blown statism or full-blown chaos. And they, they, they're not really aware of all the different options that are in between those two polar opposites where um, there's just like the public versus private thing. Same goes for government services. Same goes for government legal services, things, security services, things like that. They don't have to come from a source of government. They can come from there's market, there's choices in the market, there's that are that you know you would be voluntarily under their watch and that sort of thing. And they would compete with each other, and that would maintain the integrity of their services. So yeah, you don't need like, a monopoly on. I guess the the basic thing I'm trying to say is you don't need a monopoly on the use of force or a monopoly on. Uh, upholding law to have law upheld. Yeah, uh, I was <clears throat> thinking about all of those terms that are preceded by the term legal. You know, you got legal speed limit, you know, legal drinking age, legal uh, tender, <laughs> legal this and that, you know, but never do you hear the term lawful because it's implied, in my opinion. Like, um, you know, uh, I am a lawful person. I am a person. You know, a legal person is a corporation. You know, you never hear of a lawful person. I am a lawful person. Um, <laughs> it, it's just that, you know, I mean, yeah. maybe I'm expanding a little bit too far, you know, to start yeah. off. But at the same time, you know, they always preface that those terms because it's being declared legal. And thusly lawful when that's just not simply true at all you know um, legal is not necessarily lawful at, at all in my opinion um, it, to me they're two separate beasts but you know uh, in order for a state to thrive you need to under or you need to believe that legislation is law it, it, that's the way I perceive it because um, you have all of these policies that they want to instate and force down your throat and it's just it's a perversion of actual law to me mm -hmm. uh, and it it it, um, it stifles the market it stifles uh, personality it stifles you know people's behavior and all this and uh, that's but that that's what they want to do you know just put you in a box and call it a day, you know. It's like them, it's, and with the legal, be, everything being legal, the legal speed limit, the legal drinking age, all those things, legal voting age, it's like, to me, it's just them trying to constantly reassert their dominance and control over people and say that we control law. We are the law. When they're not, they're, they're, they are legality. They are a legal entity, but that's totally arbitrary. That's, where does that authority come from? It's supposed to come from the consent of the governed, but I don't remember giving my consent. Did you give your consent? <laughs> did you sign? <laughs> when did, did you sign that social contract when you were a baby? You know, right when you came out, the doctor held held that contract that said you consent to live here, you consent to the United States federal government and all their legalities and all their statutes and that sort of thing. You know, I I meant to sign that thing last night. I, I'm <laughs> sorry, I never did that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, children can't enter into contracts anyway, so I don't know how that would work. <laughs> right, I, right. I don't exactly. remember being I don't remember being mailed the 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 contract when I turned eighteen, being mailed yeah. it, telling. I remember having to register for the selective service, but <laughs> um. So yeah, I don't I don't know where I was going with that, but yeah. No, um, I I was thinking like. I had a conversation about, um, you know, legal ages to, you know, consent to sex, that kind of thing. And, uh, 
you know, what would we do in anarchism? You know, what would we do uh, about, you know, young people consenting to sex? And honestly, there are two answers to this. A, it doesn't matter. First off, the state is immoral. That's that's all that matters. Second, uh, second, let's let's say that that did happen. Well, first off, the family would get involved. Uh, it could be still considered rape if uh, the child is not developed in that way. Um, so uh, it doesn't matter what the actual age of the person is. It's it, it has more to do with the family and the kid and the the other person, whoever did the the act with that kid. Mm -hmm. um, I think, so in essence, what I'm trying to say is it doesn't matter. That's not what we're trying to get at. You know, uh, it, it's just a matter of, uh, well, this was brought up as well, is um, the age of a minor currently in any state could be different. You know, it could be 21 in Israel, it could be 18, and China it could be 14. I don't even know. It doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, because if the world was in an anarchist society, then uh, it would matter uh, for each certain case, whatever that case might be, exactly. as it is now as well, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be it would be an individual. It would be dealt with on an individual basis. Um, it's all about in, in in this nation in in just basic statist societies. Uh, it's all about we we we. What are we going to do about this? What are we going to do about that? What are we going to do about the behavior of this child? What are we going to do about the behavior of that drug user? What are we going to do about that prostitute? What are we going to do about uh, this guy over here operating his business without a permit? And it's what, like, why it, that's on them as an individual, or like you said, the family if they're a child. But yeah, it's 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 not a it's not a we situation. It's a we as in the family and those in their life. Right. It's uh, it's on them. It's not it's not. You know, I just don't. It's all and all the legal ages for everything is all arbitrary anyway. It's just decided by some yeah. guy. It's just decided. So. Yeah, decided by a group of 435 congressmen, 100 senators, for 300 million people. Wonderful. Uh, and you know, it's kind of, it's kind of messed up because, uh, I just found out. I believe that the source is correct that uh, Nevada is supposed to be uh, upping their drinking age. Maybe you're the one that came up with that. Um, yeah, they're going from 21 to 25 uh, pretty soon, if they haven't already. Yeah, <laughs> I want to catch that. Uh, do it again. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's pretty bad. 25 now. So eight, 18 is old enough to vote and go fight and die for the U.S. Empire, but it's not old enough to drink. And you'll never be old enough to do drugs or prostitute. Sorry. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Can you hold on yeah. just a second? Yeah, of course. We can pause. Yeah, a good show so far. Awesome. I'm going to eat my fish sticks. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. My daughter keeps trying to climb under her bed, and then she gets stuck under there. Oh, wow. She's adventurous. Good. That's how a kid should be. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I saw a picture about how uh, people are complaining that anarchists and libertarians in general, I guess, uh, only think of the individual, you know. Uh, it's all about me as opposed to we, because you just brought this up. And um, I, I had a retort, you know. Basically, um, when you focus on each individual's rights or uh, 
liberty or uh, what they should be able to do as opposed to, no, they can't do this. Uh, really, there should only be a few things that a man or a woman cannot do. You know, uh, don't steal, don't rape, don't murder, don't hit, don't punch, don't lie. You know, the, just a few things and that's it. And really, in the end, to me, it's all the same. It's all theft. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, murder is a theft of life. Uh, rape is a theft of the body. Uh, lies are a theft of the mind. You know, that kind of thing. Um, so it's I believe... Fraud, it's all fraud and aggression. That's basically right, it. right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I believe in this. That's, that's what it comes down to. So when you focus on those few things, you're telling everybody that that's what you cannot do. When you focus on the we, you usually end up say, uh, giving rights out to specific groups like veterans or women's li liberal thing, um, you know, uh, social security and just, you know, you are granted rights which are actually uh, handed out as privileges as opposed to actual rights. So you have the ability now to be married if you're homosexual. Um, though you always really did, you know, um, truly if one, is mar uh, one wants to be with another person, then you're married. It doesn't matter, matter whether the state recognizes it or not, in my opinion. Anyway, moving on. Uh, uh, these rights are given out to specific groups, which hinders the other part of the population, everybody else. You know, it's, uh, it's a privilege for some and uh, not granted to others. So that's, that's why the we, you know, when you think of uh, rights as a group is wrong. You know, you want to focus on each individual right, uh, each individual's rights. So I, I think that when you focus on that, it ends up helping the whole group, like everybody, human nature, humanity, as opposed to, you know, black people or white people or men or women, you know, that kind of thing. So I guess that's where I was coming in. Uh, what do you have to say, Thomas? Um, I don't really have anything to add to that. <laughs> you got me there. Yeah, no, it's it's a little difficult, I suppose, but uh, it's the thing is when you when you do uh, think about each individual, you end up not creating um, people that need to lead others, and so therefore the group. It, as it stands now, at least, even in a tribalist mindset, it would not exist anymore because yeah. each individual would lead their own lives. If people come to recognize each individual and, you know, finally progress all the way from Enlightenment period, you know, a few hundred years ago, uh, it will, will come to anarchy. It will happen. It, it, we may not see it in our lifetimes like you once said. But I believe that uh, people are going to get out of this tribalist mindset, you know, eventually. Yeah. No, I totally agree. It's got to be an evolution of thinking and it's consciousness uh, and uh, a more emphasis on the individual and less emphasis on the group or the collective because that is collectivism and statism in and of itself. It is the... It is the uh, the enslavement of the individual and of the individual mind and consciousness in the individual's ability to lead his or her own life. Um, it's it's all it's been all about the collective, all about the tribe, all about the country. It's always the, that same kind of theme. It's always that same motif that goes along with it. That's the common good. Uh, and yeah, it's got to just be a shift in consciousness, and I think you're right. People are starting to come around to the fact that you are an individual, and you and no one else has any more right to rule your your has any right to rule your life and to tell you what you can and can't do with your own 
body and property. Uh, and I think that that shift in consciousness and that paradigm shift is happening right now. And it's been happening for a while, I think. It's just starting to gain momentum. Um, and I think that, you know, I hope that one day it eventually will happen. I really don't think it's likely that it will happen in our lifetime. But I really hope that one day it does happen for somebody somewhere. I just think the biggest thing is going to be breaking the, the stranglehold of government because there are a lot of people in government, in this country particularly, in big developed countries with large centralized governments, uh, and the corporate state. Uh, there are just so many people, there are too many people making too much money off of the enslavement of the individual for them to just let it go. So it's gonna it's gonna take some serious. It's gonna take once the paradigm shift happens and the shift and the consciousness shifts from the collective to the individual. That's gonna be the obstacle that people need to overcome, is smashing out the rest of the collective. Those who don't want to let go, whether that's through force and and violence and self defense from them trying to continue their stranglehold on the individual, or if it's through another strategy that a lot of people say is that just the ignorance of it. Just ignore them. Don't participate in it. I think the taxes are a big thing. They're, that's a big factor in that because yeah. people paying taxes is essentially what keeps the government alive because if the tax, if the money stopped rolling in, well, let me reword that. If the money for them to repay back their Federal Reserve debt wasn't, didn't keep rolling in, they wouldn't be able to repay those debts, they wouldn't be, they would no longer be issued that money if the Federal Reserve didn't think they were going to be able to pin the debt on future generations. So I think a lot of that, that would just be, you know, I don't know if that would completely dismantle government, but that would be a huge contributing factor because it needs to, like any beast or monster, it needs to be fed to stay alive. So. Right. Um question for you, I suppose. Um, it, it's going to be very hard to get out of paying income taxes, uh, you know, the federal income tax, uh, where, you know, it's it's automatic, uh, you, you, especially where it's direct deposit, you have no say. Uh, the, the way they get you is signing the W-2 or whichever uh, in uh, in the beginning of your employment. So how do how does one get out of that system, especially when already paying the tax uh, to their employ or their employer is already paying the taxes uh, for both sides right away? Uh, and uh, so say someone comes to realize this truth and uh, believes in anarchism, how does one get out of that? Um, well, how would you get out of the taxes? That would be easy. You just turn your you on your W-2, you turn your exemptions all the way up and then you don't file. So they're not taking any money out of your paychecks and you don't file. So but eventually they're gonna you know if you if they if you do somehow pop up on their radar or they do catch wind of what you're doing you will be investigated and you might you know get in some big trouble um, but the whole thing is having enough people do it because if enough people are do if enough people did that it would have to be a it would have to be a um, a, str a very strategic and um, just all at once thing if enough people just cut off taxes cut off paying taxes all at once you have to think about the IRS is in a in in and of itself a government agency reliant on tax dollars. So if enough people quit paying those taxes, eventually they're not even going to be able to afford to pay those people to come and audit you and to do the paperwork and figure out how much money that you need to be extorted for now. Um, you know, I don't know how long that would take them. They would probably, in a in a panic, they would probably try to prosecute as many people as they could as quickly as they could and try to get that money back. But it all just comes down to people just refusing because, I mean, you have to give your ultimate consent. Otherwise, you know, they'll put you in a cage, but you're still, that's still a way of you not, not you're still not consenting to it. Um, and then how are they going to keep you in, in those prisons and jails once the funding for that is gone? So it all just... It's just 
just cut the cord, cut the funding. It just have it have to be all at once. As I like tax refusal movements, but it, it's hard to you. That's the whole that's the whole paradox of it is getting it organized and strategically placed and doing it all at once without having the thing you know blown way open before it even happens. Having them catch wind of it and start prosecuting people for conspiracy. So right. That's interesting. Um, I suppose that was off topic, but I think that's. Uh Pretty interesting stuff. Um, um, the show. Uh, do you watch the uh, the show that that guy Randall Parker Jr. does on Voluntary Virtues? Have you seen that one? No, I haven't. Okay, he's another he's another show host on our network, and his show last week was about he had a guest on, and they were talking about how to get out of basically tax refusal and how to evade how to do tax evasion. So, you know, there are ways. They're pretty much illegal, but there are ways. <laughs> it comes down to: Do you want to be legal or do you want to be moral? Right, and that's that's kind of going back to legal versus lawful. Mm -hmm. It's all, all just legalism. Ties. Yeah, all this stuff kind of ties in together. It all comes back to the same basic underlying principles. You know, it's not complex. It's not hard to understand, and it's not like it doesn't doesn't make sense. Right. It's just philosophy. It's about that uh, morality being subjective. Um, I th I believe that it's very cut and dry uh, myself. Uh, I literally believe that the non-aggression principle states what is immoral. Uh, and everything else is gray, or it, it's neither moral nor immoral. <clears throat> Except for uh, maybe love and trust. I, I think those two are what is moral. Um, you know, once someone breaks that trust, uh, that person became immoral, therefore, whatever. You know, it, you're, if the trust is broken, then what are you going to do? Um, what I'm trying to say is... Uh, if if you start at least respecting others and their rights and their just them being them, then you'll have a more moral society and a more free society. When that uh, when the trust is uh, broken between two people, then whatever. But basically, if you don't aggress on another person. You know, it's all basically subjective preference, as opposed to. Uh, I don't think there's anything else that is moral or immoral. You know, like um, you were talking about prostitution itself being neither moral or immoral. It's not like it's uh, it's not aggressing on anybody. It's just two people working together to. Uh, mutually exclusive or to a mutual benefit. Um, that's just one example, of course. You know, but uh, people gray it up with it being moral or immoral, uh, or immoral basically. And I don't think of that as being immoral. Uh, you know, when you uh, that's what I'm trying to get at, as as it were. Uh, there's to me, there's no such thing as subjective morality. No such thing, and that's that's where I was coming from. I just I remember I I, I want to bring this up because uh, I remember at one point uh, you do you did believe there is such a thing as subjective morality to a degree. Uh, can you can you explain that? I guess is what I'm trying to get at. Well. I guess I don't. I don't really believe that morale. I don't. I guess I just don't really believe in subjective morality. I'm kind of where you oh, are. Okay. I think it's. Uh, I can understand where people are coming from when they propose the idea of subjective morality, but to me, that's more of just subjective, as in people saying that. Uh, um. I don't know. I guess. I could see how something could appear moral to one person and immoral to another person. That doesn't mean that both are correct. I would just say that that would be a matter of opinion, but the whole the non-aggression principle is... Um, I don't think that that's really an opinion because 
it's just that very basic sentiment of not initiating force and aggression on another person or their property without consent. Um, and the people that try to say that morality is subjective, and that, uh, or the people that even go so far as to as to say that morality is just it's arbitrary and it doesn't mean anything. Um, um, I think that that would just be a kind of a because if you're saying that morality doesn't mean anything, you're saying that it's not that it doesn't matter if you do or do not aggress on other people or their property. Obviously, you know, I've personally never met someone who didn't mind being aggressed on or having their property aggressed on by someone else without their consent. So that right. would just be a double standard in morality if they're saying that I don't care if someone does that to you, but if someone did it to me, I would be pissed. You would be pissed because you would consider it wrong, because you would consider it immoral. You would consider it an infringement on your personal property. So. I don't know. I, in my opinion, people who talk about subjective morality or, or basically moral nihilism are just kind of, I think that's just a double standard and it's just kind of BS. It doesn't make any sense to me because you don't want to be aggressed on or have your property aggressed on. You might say that you do, but you don't, you know. Nobody does. Yeah. Nobody there does. Was... It's human nature to not, you know, want to be harmed and not want to have your things stolen from you. So to say that that doesn't matter and that's not a real thing is just kind of just ridiculous to me. There are some anarchists that will say that um, uh, they believe in might versus right, uh, or might makes right, excuse me. And so uh, you can attack another, you know, I'll, I'll just say it in these terms. You can attack another person, but yes, that other person will come to his own defense, and uh, there is no morality there, it's just, uh, it's instinctual, it is what it is, that kind of thing, uh, which makes sense to me in that sense, in, in the sense that it's natural, you know, it's a natural instinct and it's going to happen, but uh, to say that self-defense is not uh, it is the only thing holding us together uh, in anarchy, or it, it is a uh, it's a problem to me. Uh, you know, if um it, these people usually do not believe that anarchism will ever be attained, like fully. Uh, what they what these anarchists believe uh, is that. When a state, f or actually, he, this person believes in revolutions, really, and uh, it's going to happen. It's natural. This uh, uh, the statism uh, that comes about uh, is forcefully taken down by anarchists, and then uh, the state is redeveloped after some time and this is just a cycle it's a cyclical thing as mm -hmm. opposed to uh, we have an end goal and that's what I'm looking for is an end goal uh, because there are certain principles that we as humans should understand the most in my opinion um, but yeah so there are certain anarchists that believe that uh, not in anarchism but in anarchy and the idea is that anarchy is just uh, not necessarily chaotic, but a violent revolution, which is not what I envision anarchy to really be. Um, I, I get the, the distinction, I, but I don't buy it. You know what I mean? And, uh, yeah. I, I guess that's where I was going with that, uh, in that uh, there are certain anarchists that believe that there is no such thing as morality and uh, just human nature, or just nature in general. That there are cycles and we go through them because it is inevitable, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I would disagree with those people, though. I wouldn't attribute those people to anarchy or anarchism, and I would say that that's a misuse of the word and it's a misperception of the philosophy because, in my opinion, uh, anarchism is centered around morality. It is the underlying, it's what holds everything together. It's the glue, it's the fabric of the anarchist society 
of individuals, the group of individuals. I don't even like using the word society anymore. The group right. of individuals, um, I just don't know a better word to use for it, but yeah, it's basically, it's rules without rulers. It's no rule. It's not no rules. And in my opinion, those people that you were talking about, I wouldn't even attribute them to being anarchists. I would call that, um, I don't know, maybe neocons or something, where <laughs> the people that believe that I'm opposed to the state unless uh, they're unless they're imposing my will on people. So that's kind of the it's kind of the same principle where if you're okay with with the whole might makes right principle, it's uh, as long as I'm in control and I, and my will is being imposed on people, it's okay. Um, yeah, I don't know what I would maybe neo neo statists or something would that be a thing where they just stop <laughs> even, they stop they abandon the whole it's for the greater good. BS and they just go full bore that well I have a bigger stick so you know what what I say goes so yeah it sounds would, more would, barbaric yeah I would not I wouldn't contribute that to anarchism at all I would say that that's the that's the fir that's the biggest thing we want to distance ourselves from too that's what that's what a lot of people that don't understand anarchism too that's what they picture when they think anarchy is the guy with the bigger stick the bigger gang and, uh, is going to take over and be running shit, and that's government. That's statism. They are the biggest gangs. They are the ones with the biggest sticks. They are the ones uh, utilizing the might makes right ideology. Yeah. So, right. Yeah. Uh, you, you, like, you kind of agree with that? The the anarchism being centered around morality. It's where the law comes from in anarchy. Natural law. Yeah, uh, that's exactly it. Uh, I believe that there were. I uh, this is what I believe, and a lot of people are not going to agree with me on this. But um, I believe that there were uh, anarchists among the founding fathers. I know. I know that there were statists, obviously, among the founding fathers. Uh, they created the state, so. But I, I have a feeling that there were anarchists as well. There were, at, well, obviously there were libertarians there. Uh, Thomas Jefferson being one of them originally, at least, once he became president, who knows. But um, I, I feel like, uh, I feel like the ideology of minarchy stems from people actually believing in anarchy and covering it up in a way. That's that's what I believe. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, so we have probably about seven minutes left. Um, I think there, there's one... Th oh, right. I, I'm sorry. We have to go over uh, prices real quick. These prices tonight were taking at we were taken at 8.52. Tonight being the 30th. Um, last time silver was twenty dollars eighty three cents. Tonight it is twenty one oh two, and that's so that's about a twenty cent gain. Uh, gold uh, last time was thirteen fourteen ninety seven. Uh, tonight it was twenty uh, thirteen twenty five eighty nine. That's about an eleven dollar gain, and Bitcoin last time was five eighty three thirty three, uh, and tonight it was six thirty nine seventy eight. So that's about a sixty to seven seventy dollar gain. Is that right? Uh, yeah, about a seventy dollar gain. So these prices definitely did. Okay, yeah, we have time, I guess. Um, these prices have been going up for probably a couple of reasons. Normally, I would say that they would go down in the summertime, uh, and this time it seems to be going up a little bit. And I think there are a couple of reasons for this. One, there's uh, this capital control thing that's taken effect uh, Friday, Thursday or Friday, something like that. Um, and this has to do with apparently foreign accounts. If if uh, anybody has foreign accounts in a different uh, country, then these um, these prices 
or uh, I'm sorry, the uh, there are restrictions on um, having those accounts because you'll be uh, people having these accounts will be taxed, and and this is in order to um, probably control the accounts uh, because you know uh, people don't want other people to have too much money and uh, don't want to be skirted out of taxes and all this but also um, uh, basically I think that the United States knows that the dollar is going to be dropped as the world currency or whatever um, also there's going to be uh, in August I think it's August 14th. Uh, the silver fix uh, in London is going to be ending, and I want to point you guys to sgtbull.com. I believe that's correct, um, or sgt. Oh, I'm sorry, sgtreport.com. So check that out. Um, this is uh, a guy that has been talking about silver fixes and the prices of silver and gold and you know basically currencies in general um, and he, he seems to have his head in the game uh, he talks to David Morgan and all kinds of people David Morgan is huge in silver uh, so yeah just check that out uh, this once when the silver fix ends Basically, the idea of the silver fix is where uh, two times a day for the last hundred plus years, uh, silver has been fixed uh, by just two or three companies, uh, uh, banks. Uh, and this is to basically keep the price of silver down. And when this ends in August, the price of silver is going to shoot through the roof. I, I'm not. I'm not saying that it's going to happen the same day, but I wouldn't be shocked because, uh, in uh, economic terms, silver has been um, uh, the demand for silver is incongruent with the amount of supply that's coming out of the mines. Uh, that's basically what's going on. So silver is being held down deliberately, and if you think about it historically, I, you know, you know, done some simple, you know, math in my head, and I believe that the price of silver should be around a hundred dollars an ounce right now. So again, this is why I bought a bunch of silver myself. Um, I'm just waiting for a big payday, if you will. Even though technically it won't be a payday, it's staving off inflation. So that's where that's coming in, and uh, yeah, I guess I lost Thomas. I don't know what's going on, um, but in any case, uh, I think it's a good time to wrap it up anyway. So everybody, information is the currency of anarchy, and please check out Voluntary Virtues at youtubecom user Voluntary Virtues. That's where we have all of our final products of the currency of anarchy. And uh, when we tape this live on Monday nights, it's 9 o'clock. Uh, YouTube.com slash user slash cur of anarchy slash live. Check that out as well. So thank you all very much and take care of yourselves.